was higher than the value of the property. And so he had said, if you can get the property to sell um, at or above what you know the mortgage is, then anything that is yours to keep. And I was like, oh, this is the exact opportunity that I need to start up my hair care company. And I was like, I'm on, like I'm, I'm going to Louisiana and I'm not coming back until I make some money. And so I was. Hey, it's Kellen. And today, my guest, Michelle Kim, is going to tell us how she started, sustained, and succeeded in her business. It's fairly new, Michelle Hair Care, but she's not new to hair. She has over 12 years of experience, graduate of Vidal Sassoon. For those of you who say, what is that? If you're from Cali, like that's the Harvard of hair places. So that's what that is. But Michelle, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm very glad to be here. So excited you could make some time for me. Um, Michelle Hair Care is a clean hair care company that I started. Um, well, so Michelle Hair Care is a clean hair care company. So that means that we don't have any harmful ingredients. Um, I designed a dry shampoo brush uh, without having to use propellants like ethanol, propane, uh, which you'll typically find in regular aerosol dry shampoo. And I did this because as I was working as a stylist, a hairstylist, a lot of my clients were coming to me saying that they were getting like itchiness, like scalp flaking and hair loss. And I realized it's because um, all these harmful chemicals and starches are being sprayed directly onto the scalp. Um, and then settling into your pores, creating all these problems. And so to minimize all those adverse effects, I um, actually have the product right here. It's got a little, um, it's got two little brushes with different bristles to keep it off your scalp. And you can see that it's just going to absorb just the unwanted oil on your hair instead of your hair and scalp. Oh, wow. And so every great business has, you know, is solving a problem. What were you hearing from your clients? Or were you yourself just tired of, you know, dealing with the same old, same old to invent this? Yeah, well, I was hearing that people were having problems with the traditional aerosol dry shampoo, and they weren't the only ones. I was also experiencing that. At one point, I had a like a chunk of hair missing on one side of my head. And um, yeah, I just realized that we can't be using these harmful chemicals for a prolonged period of time. They might be Band-Aid fixes that you could use here and there. But for a lot of us, we have oily hair that gets oily after one day. And um, you know, washing and blow dry styling your hair every single day is a huge time suck. And so um, yeah, the day after brush kind of uh, helps people prolong their style, keeps their scalp healthy. And um, yeah, it's like easy to use anywhere. It's uh, made so that you can take it wherever you are. If you're on the move, you can pack it in your purse. You can put it in your gym bag. Um, so you can use it after the gym, before a meeting. It's just really, really versatile. Okay. And, and I'm looking at it and I'm like, man, okay, women, you guys take care of your hair every day, but there are also some guys who have long hair and, you know, they have that issue. Would this be a product that men too could use if they want to have that silky look? Oh, for sure. I mean, um, you know, this one actually has a very, um, floral fragrance so the top notes are ginger peony and pomegranate so i don't know how some guys are going to feel about that but we're actually working on a fragrance free version um and so i actually got that um uh recommendation from someone who has extremely sensitive skin and she's just afraid of putting any fragrance on her hair or near her hair. So we're working on a fragrance-free version, but yeah, I have guys coming to me all the time that say that 
oh, you know, I only wash my hair once a month because it's curly and I would like for some of the oil to be absorbed on the top of my head. And how do I move that oil from the top of my head to the bottom of my head? Because now that I haven't washed it for a month, it's really dry. So um, yeah, guys can definitely use it. Okay. And you know, you have, what is it? Two products right now on the website. The links will be in the description box, but you know, give us your, you know, how did you say, I'm going to create this? And how did you know, like how to put the pieces together? Because a lot of folks have great ideas, but then they might have to run to, you know, a factory or somebody, an engineer who actually knows how to do that. Are you just a fix it? type of person where you're like, hey, I have this, I have this, put this in the middle, boom, there's the solution. How did that work? Oh, okay. So um, I actually ended up leaving the um, hair salon because all the harmful chemicals in hair care products made me intolerant to being at the salon. So out of nowhere, my eyes would just water like crazy. I would get really congested, congested. I would break out in rashes. It got so unhealthy that I had to leave the salon altogether. And I started working as a research and development manager at a hair company. And that's when I kind of learned how to formulate, work with different ingredients, um, solve some of the problems that some of our clients were having. And so, yeah, I learned how to work with ingredients during my time as a research and developer. But then in terms of... Um, the patent pending applicator that you see, it's actually something that I had um, started designing. So I learned how to use this software called SolidWorks. It's a um, computer animated drawing software. And so um, I, I built that up. I took it to someone, someone like a mentor, and he took a look at the design and he was like, you can't go to market with that. It's so ugly. <laughs> and so... Mm -hmm kind of crashed. And then he, he kind of referred me over to a design firm. Um, so I, I got lucky. I was kind of like hooked up a little bit and still had to pay a good amount, but yeah, they created this beautiful design. They picked out the colors for me. They helped me work uh, to create a brand color that I thought was um, descriptive of what the company was about. And so we've got this like, um, this kind of like cool green blue along with like this like holographic um, writing and yeah, but it turned out pretty good. <laughs> now, how did you, you know, you when you left the salon, how did you get into research? Because I, I, I you know, talk to a lot of everybody and I've seen it always takes taking like a, another step doing what your typical hairstylist wouldn't do. But how did you even know that you could qualify and find a job doing that? Did they come to you or did you ask around and, and find somebody? You know, if they didn't come to me, I would have asked around and definitely found myself in this position either way. But it actually turned out that um, one of my really good friends had started up um, not started up. He was a part of a hair company and um, some of their clients were experiencing some issues with their products. And so he asked me about it. He asked me to test some stuff out. And then I gave them some suggestions that turned out to be beneficial for the company. And so when I said I was leaving the salon, they recruited me. And then I was there for about two years um, I actually did end up leaving because I wanted to uh, take an opportunity where I could make like a bit of money and then start up this company. So um, yeah, I, I wouldn't have left otherwise. I just really wanted to do this thing where I thought it would really help solve some problems that um, modern day women face these days. Well, you know, talking about problems, whenever we've had guests on here who say, Hey, I, I made this hair thing. It cost me 15,000 for the prototype alone. Um, and others say, how did they get 15,000, especially younger people who aren't used to, you know, knowing how much money you need in business. So when you decided to take that leap of faith into entrepreneurship, a hundred percent of your time, did you already have like a, a whole bag of, you know, a vault of money or, you know, who did anybody help friends, family, or was it like, Hey, I don't mind if I live out my car, I got to push this. 
Um, okay. So, um, uh, yeah, so I left that job and I actually went to go work for my dad who had purchased property in Louisiana. So right outside of new Orleans, uh, maybe like a year after hurricane Katrina had happened. So, uh, that property that he had purchased so long ago, I forget what year it was, but it was severely underwater meaning um, the mortgage was higher than the value of the property. And so he had said, if you can get the property to sell um, at or above what, you know, the mortgage is, then anything that is yours to keep. And I was like, oh, this is the exact opportunity that I need to start up my hair care company. And I was like, I'm on, like, I'm, I'm going to Louisiana and I'm not coming back until I make some money. And so I was there in Louisiana for like two years. And I was like miserable the first year because the climate was, it just wasn't California. And so, um, yeah, the, the first uh, year was kind of rough. And then I um, ended up really loving it there because I um, actually gave it a chance to like, um, meet some people and I fell in love with the culture. So anyway, um, yeah, so then I make um, 100,000 doing that, getting the property to a sellable condition and desirable condition. Um, and then, yeah, I took that along with um, some family and friends had helped me uh, get some capital, working capital. And so with all of that, I had enough money to start. Now, I will say that as much money as I had to start, it really, it's really, really expensive starting um, anything in manufacturing, especially if it's something not like private label and there's molds involved. Now you're involving engineers, you're involving designers, you're involving, um, you know, the, the whole mess of different manufacturers, if there's different components and you have to source things from multiple different countries, you have reiterations and then you have things that just fail and then you work on it for years and years. And then, and then there's this one tiny problem and you got to start all over again and that's more money. <laughs> so, yeah. Wow. And so, yeah, Katrina was in 05 because my wife and I, we went to the Harvard of the South Grambling State in North Louisiana. And so I, I remember that, um, you know, vividly um, th that that whole thing. But, you know, I love how your dad did that. He really made you work for it. And I love it because I do, I'm doing the same thing with my little ones where I have some property like hey, if I never do anything with it, that's theirs. And, you know, you, you can you can do what you want if you know how to flip it because I, I love that. Now, was your dad an entrepreneur? Yes, <laughs> he started his own um, house painting company. So um, he immigrated from Korea when he was 20, in his 20s. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, he, he went from um, job to job working as a painter. And then he wanted to start his own company um, but then, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, he wanted to start his own company. And then so he opened up a um, painting business. And uh, from there, he kind of um, got more people on board, had enough to kind of buy property here and there. He actually did get some like bad advice. And that's why his first investment property happened to be in Louisiana. And I know that the typical rule of thumb when you buy an investment property is for the first investment property, you want to be able to drive to that property within three hours. If you can't, more than likely it's kind of out of your reach and you shouldn't do it. And so I learned from him. And if I buy an investment property, you bet I'm gonna be able to drive there within three hours. Well, yeah, and, and being in California, it might have to be in Nevada to get a real steal <laughs> of a deal. <laughs> you know, that goes oh, yeah. And not unless you're, you know, way in the desert, whatnot. They got got a couple deals out there, um, you know, some good ones if you got a million dollars and up. But that's that's awesome. I love it. So entrepreneurship is really in your blood. We'll say that's what we're gonna say. We're always gonna give pops the credit 
it's in your blood. And, and so you have this product, you make the product, it's expensive to make, you got a, a bag to make it, but then you're also in Cali where you have the Amazon monster, you know, Amazon's real heavy on the West coast to start in my opinion. And I've lived on all the coast, but did you say, okay, now I want to put this on Amazon. Or are you holding off for Amazon to kind of, you know, just kind of prove the market to yourself? Well, um, I don't really want to end up on Amazon yet. I have a friend who's working with Amazon and um, some of the, I guess, like logistical fees that's tacked on, it kind of wipes out most of your profit. And so if I can, ideally, I'd like to just have this, um, I guess, more connected um, way of distributing the product. So right now uh, I have an e-commerce website, as you saw, uh, michelle.co. Um, and then we also have Instagram and Facebook shop. So um, yeah, we've just been having sales come in through there and it's, it's enough for now, especially because I'm also working with a distributor who is interested in having me launch with them um, early next year. So um, yeah, for me, I just kind of want to give some um, non-traditional ways of commerce first before I head into the Amazon market. Okay. I respect that. And, you know, I'm a PR guy and a consultant and I, I've hear, heard that before. The only pushback I would say is, to everybody is okay. Once you start getting into the, you know, pushing 10, 20, a hundred thousand, do you really want to, you know, push all that yourself? Some people do, but also Amazon puts you internationally a little easier. So maybe you just go up on the price and the customer pays for it and you still hit your margin is just my, my thought, just dealing with hundreds of businesses and, actually doing the groundwork of putting it on Amazon, it's gotten a lot easier than it used to be, uh, especially with products like yours and even food products. Thank God, it used to be a headache. <laughs> oh, I'm glad it's not a headache anymore because I don't know how much more headaches I can deal with. But um, uh, okay, so here's a problem. Um, this product, is so expensive to make that it's already the most expensive dry shampoo that's out on the market right now. And that's including like name brand items um, and everything that's sold at Sephora, um, even Alterna, which is supposed to be one of the most high-end hair care products. Um, I think Alterna was like 39, this one is 44. And the reason it's that expensive is because there's just that many high quality components that go into it. So this product isn't for you if you're just looking, um, like if you're just browsing like regular dry shampoos, um, this, this product, you're probably gonna fall on it if you're looking for itchy scalp solutions, for deodorizing solutions, for um, clean and organic solutions. And so, um, to, to put it on Amazon for more than $44, I just wasn't sure that anything was going to happen with it. I mean, I guess it doesn't hurt to try. Um, I just know that uh, you have to go through some training, right? And I don't know if there's any upfront costs. There's a, a small fee up front. And I mean, it's under, you know, 50 bucks, uh, depending oh. on different, different tiers. And um, the real cost is, and this happened to a client of ours, where she did not ship it. The, so she could do the prime. She didn't ship it right. So she lost all her product And it, you know, at first it was, you know, forget Amazon, but then it's no, you didn't ship it the right way. And that's why I say it's always cheaper to have a consultant and have somebody who that's all they do. Like even in our firm, we have someone who they just deal with Amazon. And so we make sure, even though I think that I got this thing locked up, I have someone who's in Seattle. I've lived, we just moved to Florida. I, I was in Seattle for six years. So we have like a different relationship with some of those companies. And so we know people who used to work for them. And so, you know, you'll know when it's right. It's no push. You'll know when it's right. And, you know, you take a glam photo shot in Monaco with the burka bag and your product 
overshadowing the bag, you're saying this is my product is for you, you know, at this time. And people always want what they can have. So folks who are getting a stimulus check right now would even say, hey, I got to have that. You know, I got to have that. That's me saying that people, not Michelle, and I'm not shaming anyone for a stimulus check, but there are people who are abusing that stimulus check, whatever that amount is. So I'm just throwing that out there. Save your money. It won't rot. <laughs> but, but, but Michelle, yeah, yeah. So, you know, are you a entrepreneur and I'm going into my shark tank mode and I'm going to ask you, do you have any goals for being on shark tank? But Kevin or Mark would ask you, are you a entrepreneur? Are you? An oh, can I say both? You, you can say whatever you want. This is a diversified game. You say what you feel. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, then both because I definitely invented the product and I'm definitely venturing my own company. So I got to say both. Okay, awesome. And so, and since we're talking Shark Tank or I'm talking Shark Tank, do you watch this show? Do you have, you know, goals of saying, hey, when I'm ready, I'm going to go on this show and I'm going to make a deal? Absolutely. I actually just randomly follow up on their website from time to time, just to see when the open castings are. Um, so I actually did look into this pretty heavily. And um, it they, they do like an open casting a year before the filming begins, or maybe a couple months before the filming begins. And then so you're you're doing that whole entire process long before that show airs. And so um, I was interested. I'm just uh, very nervous of being on, in front of those guys. And so I'm like slowly entering into like other TV shows. Um, I actually entered into one recently. They're, they're actually a pretty big um, network and uh, they had um, kind of a competition. Uh, where they gathered people from around the world to enter their ideas. And then um, I was actually named a winner. And uh, so that is actually airing sometime next month. So I'll like blast that all over social media, <laughs> get, get whatever attention I can. <laughs> but, I'm sure you can't say what network it is, huh? Because they probably have some, you know, have you hushed. Right, right. Yeah. Um, so we signed... Um, in NDA. So yeah, we got to let them drop the news first. And then, um, and then, yeah, I'll just be um, tagging myself and all their posts and stuff. No, that's, that's awesome. That's awesome. Now, when you talk about pitch competitions, I always say, you know, charity or pitches start at home. So have you entered many of the local ones, maybe during like a startup week or, you know, just for any, you know, venture vulture capitalist or angel investors besides the TV show? Yeah, I actually ended up, I wonder if I'm allowed to say this, but I ended up um, applying to Sephora's accelerator program. They have this amazing pledge going on right now where 15% of their shelf space goes to black owned um, women business. Um, and then um, another part of the pledge was to um, bring in people of color for this year's accelerator program. I did not get chosen as a finalist this year. Um, so that means I lost out on the mentorship opportunity. They also provide a grant, but I'm sure there were a bunch of wonderful people who were picked for this program. That was the one thing that I really, really wanted and it would have made my Christmas. I just found out yesterday I wasn't a finalist, but um, you know, there's always next year. There's always like a bunch of other incubator accelerator programs. There's even, um, as I was like digging into this, there's even um, free mentorship and advice, uh, advisor programs in um, the local community. So I, Pacific Community Ventures was one of the ones that I reached out to and they're like, well, you know, like even if we can't provide a grant or funding, we can still provide like a free advisor. And I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. Yes, I will take it. So yeah, they're actually trying to connect me with a mentor. And that's, like I said, like completely uh, free of charge. They, uh, I think, talk to you about three to five hours a month. So you better save up your questions, take some good notes. And yeah, it's pretty exciting. 
And I think you can talk about it because I think I saw on your YouTube, you know, a video that you did for a pitch for them. So I, I don't think they'd mind the the free press and you being so, you know, gracious and humble of not oh. winning and trying again. So, I, yeah, I don't think there'll be a problem. If so, we'd love to hear about it, um, you know, on a follow up. <laughs> but um, to, to just ask them why. But, you know, with the mentorship and I'm thinking of the question how to just put it so it makes sense to everyone. You know, there's so many local things for mentorship, even the SBA, even SCORE, uh, PTAC is one I always mention as well. And, you know, people think, oh, my business is unique. They haven't seen anything like this. Trust me, they've seen everything because they deal with thousands of business yeah. owners. So have you dealt with any of those folks and took advantage of those free mentors? Uh, no, this is actually something that I recently started looking into. Um, the mentor that I was working with previously, um, he kind of moved away. I kind of moved away. And um, uh, so I was kind of just focusing on um, building my company or getting it to the point where I can finally launch. Um, now that I'm launched and <clears throat> I'm coming across a bunch of hurdles. Uh, it's really, really hard to find uh, distributors. I don't know how much of that I can attribute to the pandemic that's going on. Um, to be kinder on myself, that's what I'm attributing it to, <laughs> that there's a pandemic going on. Maybe uh, the buying team is not um, buying right now. Who knows? Um, so yeah, I was starting to feel a bit lost. I was like, you know, my product is great. Why am I not getting into stores? And, um, you know, it's like uh, keeping me up at night. So I was like, you know what? Maybe I'll just have to like um, get like a second perspective. And I've been looking for investors to um, bring onto my company, not only for you know, the capital, but also for um, some of that advice and mentorship that I think I really need, or, you know, even just like a healthy relationship in the company. Um, but yeah, investors are, um, at least the, the investors that I'm approaching, they're not investing at this time. So um, I think I went back to square one and I was like, okay, well then um, let me at least get a mentor. And so now that's the phase that I'm at where I'm looking more into mentors as opposed to more capital. Okay. And I can already, sometimes I hear the haters, uh, Michelle. So calm down. For all my uh, VC friends, you know, everybody's an investor nowadays. And like, hey, we're investing, we're investing. <laughs> um, you know, you got I, I just saw some, or heard some pitches yesterday on the Clubhouse app where they have, you know, Pitch Tuesday and everybody's, you know, pitching. And, you know, have, you have all these folks in that lane. And I just, I just love it because once you get in those circles and you give them what they want as far as presentation, I find, and I'm, I'm, I'm spoiled because living in Seattle, this is the only place and the first place that I saw it, that we were turning down money. Like, no, we don't, we don't want that. We, we, we can't take that right now. We're not there for another business um, that we have, but you can really turn down money. So the, people are investing, but you got to find out what they're investing in and what their play is. I'm part of Florida funders out here in South Florida. Tech is all that they do. You know, um, they, they want to I don't want to say what they want to give because that might sound braggadocious, but they want to go after tech and tech is a big play. And yesterday I heard a guy just to share with you, this one entrepreneur was pitching in Clubhouse app and he's like, I, uh, it was a woman, actually. And she's like, I want three hundred thousand. And the guy was like that's so low money. Like if you would have even asked for eight million, I would have told you you probably need more. And, you know, to. <laughs> Outside of uh, investors, that's like, wait, 8 million, 300,000, give it to me, give it to me. But as you know, you can get, you know, six figures and it not be everything that you need. It's not going to last a lifetime. Ask any jewel thief, you know, <laughs> that money's going to go and, <laughs> and be spent. So they're, they're definitely there. Um, I'm going to look into my, my files. There's a link I'm going to send you for a lady who she specializes getting products into stores. And mm -hmm. I, and I can't think, and she's out in California. I do believe she's still out in Cali. She, she has um, blonde hair 
young woman, been doing this forever, and I'll, I'll send it to you. I just gotta, I'll send it to your LinkedIn because you know she she may be able to help, and it may be a program that you like. I can afford this, and it makes sense. Oh my god, that'd be amazing! Thank you. Yeah, yeah. My my hashtag is with unity we all win. So you know, entrepreneurs. That's my tribe. As Seth Godwin, you know, wrote in one of his two hundred plus books, you got to find your tribe. So entrepreneurs who are doing the work. That's my tribe. So I want to make sure, you know, um, we die empty in about 80 or 85 years from now and give it, die give it. Huh? This dang Zoom, you guys, forgive us. Oh, no. Uh, yeah. No, I hear you now. I said die empty. What does that mean? That means that when you die, you've given it all up you've given it away whether it was for pay whether it was for free that you know a lot of folks are holding on to their knowledge and they're not sharing because they're like someone should pay me pay me which is true some people are gonna die um full of just you know money uh because they don't want to share it and actually build up teams and pay people and they're like scrooge mcduck if you're you might not be old enough to remember scrooge mcduck swimming his money uh, in the vault <laughs> <laughs> I definitely do. <laughs> yeah, but but that's the 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 key. A life where it's like I gave it all up. I I can I can go. God bless me. Let me bless others. And you know I wasn't perfect, but I did what I could with you know my um my life. So that's that's the goal for me. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. So this is a newer business, but you know you have been winning in everything that you do, and so I want to know. What is a community give back that you are doing or that you plan to do in the future? Well, I'm going to be honest. I'm not really doing much of a community give back or if I am, it's not with a very like knowledgeable intent. Um, but no more, I, I would say I, yeah, I really do want to give back to the community. I don't know what I have to offer right now. But just that mentorship that I had received, um, you know, he didn't get any compensation for it. He's, you know, he's just doing it because he also, um, you know, can relate to starting up a company, um, me wanting to be an entrepreneur. So he just helped and, um, you know, built, helping me, um, refer, referring me to hit some of his people in his network, um, you know, like he wasn't sure if that would go anywhere, but just, you know, making that introduction has been extremely helpful, working with one of the best um, design firms that I've ever come across. Um, that was extremely helpful. And, um, you know, all he did was um, make the introduction and kind of like ask them to um, work with me as a like startup, like keep in mind that I'm a startup and that I have limited funds. And <clears throat> yeah, I would love to be able to do that for other people. Um, Yesterday, when um, we were all waiting for Sephora to get back to us, if we were named a finalist or not, um, one of the girls on the website that we had submitted our application to, she started a thread and she started asking people like, oh, like, did anybody get their um, email yet? I'm, I'm waiting by the phone. Um, I feel like a teenager in a rom-com and we're all just like, no, we didn't get it. Like, when is it coming? And, you know, we're all anxious. And um, yeah, I just wanted to like ask all those girls like, oh my gosh, like, what is your company name? Some of them left like their Instagram handles. And, you know, we just like wanted to be a community, be there for each other. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs have that kind of sense of like wanting to like help others give back because it is like rough starting up a company, you feel alone all the time. Like it's, <clears throat> yeah, it's just, it's just really, really hard. So you want to be there for other people, but you're so limited on like what you can give right now because you're also struggling. You're like barely made it to like the first step of the ladder. So yeah, def definitely do want to give back in however way I can. Oh, there's so, so much that you could do with your knowledge, whether it be, you know, uh, mentorship for others like you're seeking and you, you know, give and just let somebody shadow you or, you know, maybe you'll write a book or put a documentary together on how this all came together. And, you know, it, but that that urge never stops. 
for an entrepreneur, I don't think, you know, interviewing so many people and just talking to people outside of interviews, I'm a walking billboard and that never stops. It's like, you know, what's the next thing? And, and you just, it's like a singer or when someone's going to give a speech, if you're not nervous before doing that, you're not meant to do that. Like you should just go sit down and let somebody else who's really excited, like a comedian ready to get on stage. You're going to have all the butterflies, even me for every interview. I'm like, Oh man, what am I going to say? You know, but you're supposed to have that feeling. It's fighters have that same feeling. If you listen to them, they'll be like, man, I'm, I'm nervous, but I got to kill this guy, you know, cause that's what I, that's what I, I, I do. <laughs> so, yeah. so, so, you know, um, it, when I talk about writing a book, have you started jotting down anything? No, I'm not much of a writer. I, although um, in high school, I, I did really, really bad in high school. So math was not my thing. History was not my thing. You can't tell me to memorize the exact dates for whenever something happened. It's just, it's just not going to happen. Um, science not really my thing, although it was interesting. I just wasn't that good at it, but I was really, really good at English. So I, I think the lowest grade I ever got was like A minus in English, maybe a B, but I just loved English. Um, but I think I just kind of liked grammar and vocabulary. I didn't really like writing. So like writing a book probably would not happen unless, you know, there was some way for someone to just ask me a bunch of questions. I answer it and then they write it. <laughs> okay. Okay. No, no, that, I mean, you can hire somebody to do that. And, you know, in, in high school, that wasn't my thing either. Cause they're not teaching anything that, you know, I found to be that interesting. I mean, you come, you memorize some stuff, but um, I, I don't like wasting time. And I always knew what I wanted to do. Thank God. Now with you having a beauty product and being an American with, you know, um, a heritage to Korea, I'm a K-pop fan. So I have to ask if at all you've reached out to any maybe you know outlets out in korea to say hey maybe i can get an artist to kind of promote this using influencer marketing and maybe they can make a song or i can make my own song and have someone sing it if that's not my thing but i mean we got to be creative nowadays so i just i'm just wondering have you tapped into that or at all oh um that's genius first of all um but no i have not um, I barely know my K-pop brands. I know of like the ones that like ended up in like Super Bowl, like Blackpink, I think was one of them. <laughs> and then I know like BTS because I think they like also performed for the Emmys or something. Um, but no, I mean, I speak Korean, I read Korean, I write Korean. Um, but in terms of like K-pop, I think that phase happened for me in middle school and then I kind of just like never really looked back, but that's genius. Like I would love to work with any artist, like whether here um, or in Korea or anywhere else, really, um, that would be amazing to work with them. I'm kind of, um, I'm not new to social media. I've had social media accounts for a really, really long time since I was in high school or college. Um, but I just don't really utilize it very much. And um, starting this company, I realized like, oh, that was a big no-no. Like I really should be on social media. I should learn to appreciate it for all it's worth because you know, as many downsides as there are to social media, there's so many powerful tools in there that you can use in a healthy way um, to kind of like promote yourself to gain awareness. Um, so I've just kind of recently been getting into that, trying to build my followers, learning how to take pictures. I mean, I bought like an 11 iPhone 11 pro it's a, like an $1,100 phone and I'm not taking any pictures. And I'm like, why did I buy this phone? So now like, you know, my boyfriend got me like this, like professional lighting kit. It's like kind of really easy to like set up some, um, like photography shoots. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm starting to learn how to use all that. And I like, it didn't even cross my mind to reach out to other people to kind of do a collab or, or try to get some awareness from other people. 
Do you ever feel stifled, um, you know, <laughs> a- Asian culture, American culture, um, you know, there's the, how people think Asian women are. For some reason, people think Asian women are quiet. I tell them you don't know enough Asian women and you need to, you need to get out more. But do you feel like, because you're an attractive woman where you could be, you know, your own model and you could go and, you know, do your hair and take all the poses of your typical Instagram girl. But do you feel as an entrepreneur, if I do too much on social media, they'll look at me a certain way. You know, my person, you know, maybe my clients, maybe my family do you ever feel like you're in this box no no I kind of feel like um no I, I I don't relate to that because I don't like the spotlight so that's kind of one of the reasons that I could never really get into social media because it felt a lot like oh look at me like this is what I'm doing today like um look how cool I am <laughs> so but you know of course like that's that's not what it is um I just had a very like um negative outlook on social media and that all kind of changed um as like I I got to connect more with people that I typically wouldn't be able to connect with in person or even over the phone because like um, you know, everyone's so busy. You don't really have time to like text someone and, and then do this like long follow up. But if you kind of get to see their pictures, you know what they're up to, they're doing great. That's, that's good. Um, but for me, I, um, you know, I don't think I'm ugly, but I don't really, um, look at my pictures and be like, yeah, like that looks good. Or, you know, I just, um, I guess also I don't want to be judged. So I don't want to put myself out there. I'd rather, um, be able to have, um, other ways for our media to represent what Michelle hair care is. Now I'm trying to get past all that, um, the shyness, the quiet, the quietness, like I can be very introverted. If you, um, one of the best things to happen to me this year was the lockdown. (laughs) (laughs) because I love being at home I mean the downside is you know all the gyms closed and um, it did get really difficult to see family during the holidays and you know I was like oh okay well now I'm pretty bummed but yeah I don't mind being alone Um, but uh, yeah I guess I should work on being more social and um, yeah more confident I guess well, you you are who you are and, you know, um, you, you know who you are and you might know who you want to be or you're like, I'm cool being me. So there, there's no judgment. I'm just wondering because many of, you know, when you get in the boardroom and dealing with so many influencers, they feel like they're women aren't they're not taken seriously. And it's because, you know, hey, I'm you're half naked. And then we're coming in as a team and they're like, you know. I I just don't feel like they're respecting me. They think I'm some bimbo or whatnot. And they could have went to Harvard or they could have no degree from from anywhere, but they may be just, you know, brilliant. But so I I just wonder that. And I cannot answer that for the audience because I'm not a woman. And I don't, you know, I don't have that that judgment people look at my love locks and probably say oh no we gotta run (laughs) you know (laughs) and and and, and then they'll they'll start maybe talking to me and say oh okay this guy is like a a mensa graduate if his mother would have allowed but um you know he he's he's on a different different level but just just curious if that's something that you you deal with because of the when we're talking about diversity it's just how Asian women are looked at as entrepreneurs. And I hear it, you know, behind the scenes and have to check it. Like, you got to get right. Like, you don't know enough people. I don't know who you grew up around, but, you know, you saying you're quiet. I bet you if we get your boyfriend on here, he'll have a different story to tell. <laughs> oh, well, I don't know if he would. Um, well, okay. So Asian women entrepreneurs, um, I don't know if they're overlooked or not, to be honest, um, because I have not really had the pleasure of interacting with other Asian women entrepreneurs or, um, or I have, and they're just so, um, 
you know, they've achieved a lot. So they've got like multiple walls. So if I want to talk to them, I'm just kind of talking to like um, their assistant or something. So I actually don't have a very good read on that. Um, and in terms of my interactions with other people, when I go into meetings to um, seek funding or um, advice or partnering with people, um, yeah, I would say it's kind of all over the place. There are some people, especially here in SF, I noticed they're very um, chill and they're very, very um, everyone's an equal and um, nothing, nothing but good things to say about the interactions that I've had here. Now in Orange County, there are some people who kind of um, think that maybe you have like this like twisted agenda for meeting with them. And like, they kind of like, don't want you to get too close. And, um, and then there's other people who just like flat out want to take you out on a date. Like I've had, um, I've had uh, some, someone um, connect with me on LinkedIn and then, you know, he's like, oh, you know, like I'm very interested in learning about your company. And then his follow-up thing was, Oh crap, I forget what it was. And I was like, oh, you're a creep. Like, stop. <laughs> but um he, he had to shoot his shot. <laughs> yeah, but it's just like, come on, dude. Like, you found me on LinkedIn. Like, how interested do you think I really am on LinkedIn? Like, if you saw me like on, I don't know, Tinder, like go ahead. But yeah, that I was just like, oh man, you're the worst. Um, but yeah, I mean, things like that happen and I think you just have to learn to get past it because, you know, um, it just kind of happens. Uh, yeah. Well, it happens to, you know, you, you women more than, than anybody. When it happens to guys, we have no idea, um, you know. When oh, no, you do not. <laughs> yeah. When it's other guys, like we're like, and my wife would be like, hey, that sounds kind of weird. I'm like huh, I didn't think of it like that. But she also thinks football is weird because the quarterback has to put his hands in between another man's legs. So, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so. <laughs> but but yeah, she, she's from West Africa. Things are a little, a little different um, <laughs> uh, over there, you know. But no, that's, that's interesting. You get hit up with uh, the LinkedIn player. Well, you guys, we could go on for days and days and we may, but it'll be off air. And I want you guys to like, share, subscribe, look at the description box and go check out the product, even check out her YouTube. If you're like, Hey, I want to even see more on how it works. Um, all that will be linked in Michelle. I thank you for coming on. Thank you. It was very nice to be here. Um <laughs>